where most things that are worthwhile, like laughter and love and happiness, those things are abundant. But there are a few things in this world that are scarce, time being the most obvious example. And any time that we are dealing with a limited resource, we can afford to do anything with it, but we can't afford everything. Which means that any time we're dealing with a limited resource, whether it's money, time, energy, attention, focus... We have to make decisions, choices about what we're going to do. You can afford anything, but not everything. My name is Paula Pant. I'm the host of the Afford Anything podcast, a show that is dedicated to exploring these ideas, these questions about how to make better decisions so that we can live a more meaningful life. Today, I've invited a guest on the show by the name of Michael Kitsis. Michael is best known for being an alphabet soup of designated financial planning credentials. He has a master's in financial services, a master's in taxation. He's a certified financial planner, a chartered financial consultant, a chartered advisor of senior living. He's he's got the whole gamut and he's a, built a very successful practice as a financial advisor, as well as a writer and a speaker on finance. But when I brought him onto the show, I thought that we were going to go pretty deep into the weeds of talking about how to make decisions about your life. I initially invited him onto the show to discuss the thorny and very complicated question of, should you put your money into market investments? Or particularly if you're younger, should you put that money into investing in yourself, building your skills, building your career? I wanted to really tackle that subject from a mathematical approach. And that is how I began the interview. But as it unfolded, his story came out. And... Well, I'll let you listen to it because I hope that this is one of those interviews that really blends thought and emotion together in a way that I've been intending to. Without any further delay, Michael Kitsis on how to decide where you should dedicate your investments. Hey, Michael. Hello, Paula. Good to be here. Oh, thank you for coming on the show. My pleasure. Thanks for having me over. I wanted to chat with you. Uh, your blog, Nerd's Eye View, I love how deep you go into a lot of topics, and there's so much there that we could talk about. But I actually wanted to talk to you about something that you've written about uh, that I think isn't discussed enough, and it's the concept of human capital. Now, human capital. Human capital. It sounds kind of a, <laughs> like a strange sort of thing. What, what do you do with human capital? So uh, for the listeners, can you define what that means? The idea of human capital, is the easiest way to define it is sort of contrast it with our money. So in economic terms, our money is our financial capital. So we might categorize our financial capital, our investment accounts, our bank accounts, our cash, our retirement accounts, like all of these different things that are financial instruments. You know, uh, uh, they have economic value because the monetary system says they does. That's what we define as our our financial capital. And it's pretty straightforward. Like we can make a balance sheet and figure out what we've got and add up all the different accounts. So the idea of human capital is to say, really, there's actually a second mechanism that most of us have for earning and generating money. Number one is our financial capital. I can invest and get interest and dividends and capital gains and all that. And the alternative is I can work. I can literally go out and do things as long as I'm physically uh, capable. And that, that ability to earn, that earnings power, is what the economics world dubs human capital. So the idea like I can generate income, I can generate cash flow myself in two ways. Number one is I put my financial capital to work by investing. And number two is that I put my human capital to work by working, by literally engaging in activities that earn and generate income. So would human capital be the equivalent of trading time for money? You know, I earn X per hour or I earn X per year? Yeah, in in the purest sense. And the economic side of it, that that's basically how they quantify it. So you might say, okay, your your human capital is is in the simplest way. Okay, I, I make fifty thousand dollars a year, and I'm going to be working for the next thirty years. And so there's about a one point five million dollar pile of money there that is earnings that I haven't earned yet, but I'm physically capable of going out and earning cumulatively over the coming years. Mm-hmm. And that's actually a really 
really big pile of money. Mm -hmm. And that's part of what leads to some really interesting strategies around how to plan for and maximize your finances. Because you know, as soon as you sit down and look at it that way and say, okay, so I'm you know 20 something years old and just getting going in my career and just got a really nice raise and you know now I'm making 40 or fifty thousand dollars. That's an awesome number. But when you sit down and say, okay, so you've really got two assets right now. You've got your financial capital, which frankly may or may not even be positive, depending on how much student loan debt you came out with. Mm -hmm. Trying to build that up to be positive, get some emergency savings, get some retirement savings going. And then you've got this human capital side that's really actually the equivalent of probably a one or two million dollar asset mm -hmm. on your personal balance sheet. It's just this giant pile of untapped potential, literally the years you have not gone and worked and earned the money to generate the return with your human capital yet. So I want to lead this conversation down two different paths. One path will assume that a person wants to retire at a traditional age, which I would define as 62 or older. Okay. And then the second path, um, I'd like to talk about people who want to retire after only spending, you know, a total of maybe 10, 15, 20 years in the workforce. Sure. So I'd like to approach both of them, but I don't want to conflate the two as we talk, particularly as we're defining concepts. Well, you know, I, ironically, in this framework, they I, I would actually view them really similarly. They're They're just different points along a similar spectrum. So you know, if you envision like you just graduated from school, mm -hmm. you're full of potential, mm -hmm. you've got an immense amount of human capital, all the years you're going to be working going forward that you haven't earned yet, but it's coming. Mm -hmm. And then your financial capital, which pretty much starts at zero, because unless you inherited or got money by some other means, like you don't have any yet. You, you got lots of earning potential, no actual financial capital yet. Right. So that's the picture for most recent college graduates. Right. And, mm -hmm. and you know, we're, we're just hoping we get to start the financial capital number at zero and maybe not a negative number. Right. Once we start moving forward from there, every year we earn, essentially, we're turning human capital into financial capital. Mm -hmm. You know, I do the work, I get some checks. Now I got to decide what to do with my checks. And in, in the simplest sense, I have two choices. Option one, I spend it. Option one, I save it so that I can spend it later. And, and that's sort of the essence of retirement savings. So if you envision yourself as I've got this giant pile of human capital, as I work over time, I'm going to convert it into some combination of money I spend now and money I'm going to uh, save so that I can spend later. Then really almost all forms of retirement ultimately just come down to that spectrum of saving and spending how much of, as you turn your human capital into income, how much of it is going to go into each bucket? How much is going to go into the current spending bucket? And how much is it going, of it is going to go into the basically future spending bucket, mm -hmm. i.e. savings for future retirement? And so the, then it gets pretty straightforward. The, the, the more you're willing to shift towards the save bucket and the less you're, you put towards the spend bucket, the more you can build up the financial capital to the point where you reach that moment of financial independence where all of a sudden you say, I don't actually need to work and earn any income anymore because I've got enough financial capital to pay all my bills. I don't need my human capital. And so I'm literally just going to walk away from it. I'm going to walk away from the job. I'm going to stop earning. Don't need the money anymore. And that's where, you know, most financial advice, at least that I've read, the dominant conversation seems to be about how to handle your financial capital. But the thing that I find really interesting and the conversation that I think we're not having enough is as you are making investments, do you direct those investments towards optimizing your financial capital as it works for you in what we would just broadly call the market? And I mean that in a very broad sense, yep. as your capital is working for you in the way in which it does, whether that's real estate or the stock market or bonds or or a gold bunker that you've built underground, whatever it is. <laughs> whatever it is. Hey, Amen. We invest in a wide variety of ways. <laughs> so broadly speaking, I would just refer to that as the market for the for this conversation. This is getting to be a long question. Uh, most of the conversation that we have is around how to allocate that financial capital. But you've often talked about whether or not that money could be better served investing in human capital. All right. So when when you look at your earnings power. Mm -hmm as you know, this, this giant pile of money for all the cumulative years that you're going to earn. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of interesting things that happen. The, the first is you realize it's, it's really darn big. Uh, uh, you know, again, even like 
making thirty or forty thousand dollars a year for the next thirty years is actually like a million dollar pile of money. Mm-hmm. Now the bad news is when you add up all your spending cumulatively for thirty years, it's an ungodly large amount of spending as well. So these things kind of offset each other and you still have to get back to what do you save and what do you spend and what do you save? But here's the interesting effect that crops up. So if if you look at this and say, all right, I'm I'm making uh you my goal is to work for thirty years and I'm gonna make uh, I'm making $50,000 a year right now because I just got that good promotion at work. And you multiply it out, that's basically a $1.5 million pool of money. For any of the engineers out there, technically, you calculate this with an inflation adjusted and discount it back for real rates of return. So inflation adjusted, there would be some adjustment where there would be some further adjustments, but just trying to keep this relatively simple. Yeah. Imagine it is 30 years of $50,000 a year is is $1.5 million. Right. So we tend to spend a lot of time saying like, hey, if I can save a couple percent on my income and like I can save $5,000 and if I you grow that $5,000, if it grows at, at 8%, I, I increase my net worth by $400 and you know, compound it out over 30 years, that's actually a really big number. Mm-hmm. Uh, returns compounding for a long time really add up. But the interesting effect that crops up is you say, well, what would happen if to my human capital, if instead of putting my money into a Roth IRA, I went out and took some kind of training class that got me a raise or another promotion at work? So like instead of putting a couple thousand dollars into my Roth IRA to get that lifetime tax-free growth, I put the couple thousand dollars into a class for myself and next year I managed to get a 10% raise. Mm-hmm. So if I do that, it might not feel very good in the short term. You know, I spend a couple thousand dollars to get a raise that's worth a couple thousand dollars. And at the end of the year, I'm like basically still treading water. Mm-hmm. But if you think of it in terms of your human capital, so if I was going to work for 30 years and make 50 grand, and I can figure out how to work for 30 years and make 55 grand, that's actually $150,000 of additional cumulative income I can generate over the next 30 years. Mm-hmm. Now, all of a sudden, spending a couple thousand dollars on classes or courses or a certification or whatever it is in your industry or chosen career, it's not just, hey, I spent a couple thousand dollars and I got a raise for a couple thousand dollars. It's I spent a couple hundred thousand dollars and I increased the cumulative value of my human capital by like a hundred grand. I got a 20 to one return mm-hmm. on investing in myself. Right. And it seems like if you planned on retiring early, you could you could just run the same equation with a different multiplier. So I yep. now have a $5,000 raise. I plan on staying in the workforce for 10 more years. You know, therefore, that, that $5,000 raise is worth $50,000. And if it costs right. me $3,000 to get it, then that's an amazing return. Right. And so the the moving levers for retirement almost across the board, we kind of come back to the same couple of things. There's the one that we talk about a lot, even even including those that are – uh, kind of really active in the in the extreme early retirement movement, which is very heavily focused around uh, the the saving versus the spending. So uh, you know, if if every year I work and I earn my income, I can overgeneralizing a little, I get to divide it in two buckets: spend now or spend later. Mm-hmm. Th- if I want to retire early, I need to make the spend later bucket really big. And if I'm going to make the spend later bucket really big, I need to put a lot of money towards the spend later bucket every year, which means I have to constrain my current lifestyle. So I live very frugally and I try to minimize my expenses. And you know, there's a whole other discussion around just minimalist living in general and whether it makes us happy or not. But uh, j- just from the kind of the <laughs> the math of retirement and as I'm earning, if I want to retire earlier, I have to spend less so that I can build the financial bucket up faster, which actually works for me twice. A, the less I spend, the more my financial bucket builds up. And the less I spend, the less cash flow I actually have to replace once I stop working because if my lifestyle expenses are more moderate, I don't need to or as much human capital to support it now and I won't need as much financial capital to support it later. So you, you kind of win twice mm-hmm. by, by managing your expenses down. But all the discussion is around the saving versus spending. You know, how do you manage your expenses and minimize your expenses so that you can save more to retire early? And I find very few people spend much time talking about, well, you know, if you just try to go out and find a way to earn a little bit more, re- reinvest it in yourself to get more income or more of a raise, you can actually still propel yourself to uh, retirement or even early retirement even faster mm-hmm. because it actually still moves the needle so dramatically when you add up the, the your cumulative earnings power, even in an early retirement scenario. 
But so here is the literally the million dollar question. When you are spending money on investing in yourself, uh, when you're spending money on building that human capital, how do you know that you're making a good investment? I mean, if you're buying VTSAX, you know exactly what you're getting. You know you're yep. going to do you- as well or as poorly as the overall economy. But what about when you take a class? I mean, or you try to develop a new skill? How do you evaluate that? It's a good question. The purest sense is just, does this give me a path to being able to to earn more down the road? Mm-hmm. And I, the challenge to me in this is some of us have careers or, or some of us land in jobs and professions that just lay this out a little bit more clearly than others. No, no real rhyme or reason to it. It's just how it how it turns out, though. So there are some industries out there. Uh, you know, if, if I'm in the computer industry and I want to climb up a little bit more, I got to go get some more certifications and learn more programming languages or systems management administration or what, whatever it is in the uh, the particular subfield you're in, in in computers and technology. And and that's your path forward. If you're in management, you've got a, a slightly different trajectory. It might be learning project management skills or becoming, a, I think it's a CMP for project management. Maybe it's going back to grad school and, and you know, actually getting an MBA. When you get into some other careers, it's unfortunately a little a little bit less vague. There's not as much of a clear clear cut career path forward. And you have to forge your way forward a little bit more and and kind of find the path as it goes. I, that was certainly, you know, I went through a version of that myself because the the irony is even in the world of financial advising, which is my my world of my career, there's there's actually very little that defines a clear career track. The irony in the world of financial advising is that our entry standards are very, very low because you, you pretty much just have to get a license to be a salesperson. And everything above and beyond that is all purely voluntary. There's no guarantee that you know, when I go get a certified financial planner designation that I was going to make more money as a financial advisor, except kind of the general belief that holds relatively true across most careers, which is if you upgrade your skills and you know more than most others, there's usually a path to more dollars that's attached to it at some point. Hmm. And while there are probably exceptions to that rule in almost anywhere where you can come up with a scenario where someone is very well educated yet somehow manages to self-sabotage or self-destruct themselves down to to not getting promotions, even then it's it's often because they – somehow did something to themselves that blew up their ability to get the promotion, invest in themselves and getting more education or, or certifications or training or whatever it is in your career still is pretty much the path forward for almost almost anyone, almost anywhere, I find. So this actually leads me to two follow-up questions. The first is, how can you evaluate if it's better to direct your human capital investments towards your primary career versus some sort of secondary side business or side hustle, as we like to call it? You know, to me, the biggest driver there is simply what what are the prospects in the career or the industry that you're in? And again, some people just have a lot more upside to where they are than others. You know, if you're sitting in a, a dead-end job somewhere saying, working at a company that isn't growing, saying, I just, I don't see a path forward to making any more money or doing better where I am. So, you know, Hint number one, the writing should be on the wall. You, you need to leave and move on at some point. Mm-hmm. And then option number two becomes, all right, are you going to try to move forward in this career or, or or profession or industry that you're in? Or do you want to go out and try to get this going with a side hustle on your own? That distinction, I think some of it is just look around at the options in your industry, you know, go online and search for career tracks and, you know, what the income potential is for the next tier up and whatever your industry is. You know, if you're a marketing associate, what's the opportunity to be a marketing manager and see what your income potential is. And the alternative is if that really feels dead end, if you don't see the upside opportunity there, then I think side hustles start start coming to the table. And and the irony for so many people is that a lot of side hustles turn into careers later. You know, even for what I do today, I started out in the world of financial advising and just started doing a little bit of blogging and writing and speaking on the side because it was essentially a side hustle for me. I thought it was interesting and I just, I liked nerding out on stuff and sharing it with other people and did that slow and steadily as a side hustle for literally probably three or four years 
and saw it slowly and steadily build to the point where after I was in about four years, I said, you know what, I actually want to make this my primary. And I can flipped the career switch and said, all right, I'm, I'm going to be primarily a, a writer and speaker, and I'm going to dial back how much time I spend in an advisory firm. And now probably 10, almost 10 years since I made that switch, that's still kind of the, the balance. So the, the first almost 10 years of my career, I was primarily a financial advisor that did writing and speaking on the side. And now I'm primarily a writer and speaker and educator, and I still do financial advising on the side, and I'm still a, a partner back to an advisory firm, but that's now well under half of the time of, of what I do because the side hustle became the main gig. Hmm. And was that because it was more lucrative or because you enjoyed it more or or a bit of both? Honestly, it started out that it was just uh, – it was more interesting. And I, mm-hmm. I feel like I'm like bashing my original job and career. I, it wasn't right. that the old one was uninteresting. It, w- it was just that it was more interesting. It spoke to me more directly. I just – I felt more energized. I felt more excited getting up in the morning uh, doing that kind of work. What ultimately happened – and I can say this. There's no academic empirical analysis for this. It's just what I see – live working with clients as an advisor, there is an effect that happens where when you actually find work that you enjoy doing or you're excited to get up out of bed in the morning to do it, all the math starts to change. You know, it ended out being by far more lucrative than any of the prior work that I was doing and and financial advising even actually has a pretty good income potential. Uh, it, It ended out being far more impactful financially as well simply because once you really get engaged in the work that you're doing, you tend to like doing it, want to do more of it. And it turns out usually if you're that engaged, you tend to get pretty good at it. And if you tend to get pretty good at it, that ends up making more income potential as well. And so particularly for people who don't necessarily have a clear trajectory in terms of if I take X course, my job will give me Y promotion. Would it be fair to say that a major part of their selection criteria for do I spend this $5,000 investing in, you know, earning more at my primary job versus building a side hustle, would it be fair to say that the best answer would be go where your interest is? Or go, I don't, I, don't, I hate to use the word yeah. passion so overused. Yeah, but. I know there, there's sort of a, I feel the same way there. Uh, I, I feel like we sort of overshot the world of pursue your passions, the point now where I feel like we maybe convinced a few people to become passionate poppers because they just followed a passion down a road that really genuinely had no business potential. Mm -hmm. But I think at a minimum, it it is pursuing your interests. It's it's pursuing things that you're passionate about and enjoy. I'm I'm always even a little bit wary of people that come and say like, this is my my passion. Because again, just having sat across from so many clients who go down this road for so many years, like First of all, we rarely even really know what our passion is going to be when we're young. We, we think we know what the thing is. Then we get down the road and find that we may or may not like it. And, you know, for, I imagine, a lot of listeners here, either for themselves or a good friend that they know, you know someone that went to college just absolutely convinced that you know they were going to pursue this particular major. That was their passion, in air quotes. And now they're a couple years out of college and they're doing work that has nothing to do with what they studied in college. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, you know, we we thought it was our passion. Then we went and did it for a while. We're like, yeah, this actually isn't really doing it for me. And and that's okay. That's okay to make those changes. It just means don't make the stakes so high for yourself. And like, I have to find today the thing I'm going to do that's going to be awesome and amazing for the next 30 years. Like, find a thing that you can do that will make you slightly more excited to get out of bed next month. Keep the stakes low Mm -hmm. because if you find something that's positive and starts building you in a positive direction, the more energized you get, the more you tend to take the steps to keep moving yourself forward. And and I've watched that that kind of formula play out for people over and over again over the years. Right. So let's say that you um, and I'm asking this question because I know there there are a lot of nerds who love to analyze the returns that they are getting on every dollar that they've put in. So, you know, let, let's say that you invest, I don't know, $5,000 a year into starting small online businesses or taking classes, uh, taking some online classes. You know, you you invest this money into developing a side hustle or a side business that you're interested in. And that kind of leads you on a sideways meandering path, you know, that might 
go from A to B to C to D to E. Yep. And ultimately, maybe in the long run, you end up better than you were before, but you had a lot of diversions along the way. Is there any way to evaluate the the ROI on the money that you spent or is it all just part of the narrative? Yeah, you know, there's a blend. I, I think a lot of it is just realistically as part of the narrative. But I, I think there are a couple of things that you can do to at least you know, to try to protect yourself from from not unwittingly digging a bigger hole in, in kind of going down this journey and, and pursuing the narrative. So step one to that is it is about investing yourself and in, and kind of upgrading your opportunities. It doesn't mean you need to do this giant like go big or go home. Like, hey, I heard on this podcast that I should invest in myself, so I'm going to quit my job and go back to school and get a master's degree and spend three years earning no money and hope that I earn that back again five or six years from now. Like, you you don't have to make the stakes quite that high for yourself. You know, when I look at a lot of folks that I interact with, even within our field. You know, one of the number ones that that I end up telling people when they're coming out of school is go take a writing class, mm-hmm. not not like creative writing, like how <laughs> to write emails that make you sound intelligent when you communicate with people. And I know that's kind of hurtful for some folks that like their shorthand emails and their quick notes. But if you want to climb a ladder in the business world in most places, the reality is first impressions do matter. And in a digital world now, for so many people, your first impression is an email that mm-hmm. you send out or some kind of written communication. And if it's sloppy and poorly punctuated and bad spelling and all that, it sets a poor impression mm-hmm. for people. And again, I, I can only imagine a couple of folks that are probably screaming at the their the podcast right now <laughs> as they're as they're listening to it. But you know, just having watched people play this out as someone who who actually is a business owner of of multiple businesses uh, that screens way more resumes than I frankly wish to screen. <laughs> just it's it's a factual reality. You know, when when you're applying for a job with a whole bunch of other people that are applying for a job, the sad truth is the person who's got to make a hiring decision and has 57 resumes and has to at least get it down to like a dozen that's workable are looking for pretty much any reasonable excuse to cull the initial resumes and badly written cover letter that uses terrible grammar and punctuation and says, you know, hire me, I have great attention to detail. (laughs) Like, if your attention to detail isn't good enough to actually put that much work into a cover letter you sent me, I'm probably not going to give you an interview. And it sucks and it's unfair and it's life and it's reality. And so... You know, the to me the starting point is things like that. What can we do to improve writing skills? What can we do to improve basic public speaking skills? I'm a huge fan of telling people go try out Toastmasters. Mm-hmm. Basically, well, you know, it started with like teaching people how to do toasts, you know, at a party. But essentially, it teaches you how to do public speaking and prompt to public speaking skills. Oh, that's why they're called Toastmasters. I'd always wondered yep. that. Yeah, yeah, like, you know, uh, it's the yeah, wedding. Yeah, like a wedding toast. Kind of a toast. Yep. Oh, I just thought they were really into carbs. I don't know. No, yeah, well, that, <laughs> that would be taking them downhill these days. You know, <laughs> Atkins almost put them under. Uh, <laughs> you know, th- Again, it's one of those things, like, you don't get a lot of opportunities necessarily in life to make big impacts that can change your trajectory if, you know, you're the one in a moment that's able to actually stand up and – move some problem forward in your job or your or your career, that can be a seminal pivot of moment for you. And most people are terrified to step up to the challenge because because we hate public speaking. You know, mm-hmm. we hate public speaking. I mean, there was some um, a survey I'd seen because I I do a lot of professional speaking, so we love to circulate these jokes. There was some survey that someone had done that we are actually more afraid of public speaking than we are of death. Right. Which basically means I'd rather be in the casket than giving the eulogy. Right, right. That's how terrified we are of it. And so Toastmasters is just a group that's built to help you get over these fears. It's a whole bunch of folks. You know, you teach and learn how to uh, give impromptu, small impromptu speeches in front of small groups. Mm-hmm. Everybody else in the room is just as terrified as you. So you're all <laughs> there together to support each other and get through it. And and I've seen people where ultimately it was it was transformative to their business success in their career trajectory because 
they were they just became better able to speak up in meetings that ultimately got them noticed by their by their boss, which ultimately got them moving forward. And, you know, their whole their whole career trajectory and financial capital was dramatically updated by what at the end of the day was just hanging out with Toastmasters and figuring out how to get more comfortable in in speeches. And I, mm-hmm. I, I think it's like a hundred bucks a year to join. Mm-hmm. Might even be cheaper than that. Yeah. So a lot of what I'm talking about, about how we upgrade our skills. You know, I mean, the reality is spending a hundred dollars to join Toastmasters and a couple hundred dollars to take a writing class and maybe a couple hundred dollars to learn advanced Excel skills. We're not talking about $50,000 tuition bills. We're talking about a couple hundred dollars here and a couple hundred dollars there at the most, but not trying to figure out just how do we save it and add another couple hundred dollars to our Roth IRA so it's going to grow tax-free for the next 30 years. It's how do we apply this money in a way that gives us more upside potential, more bonus potential, uh, more promotion potential? Because the reality is it becomes very uneven. Like, I don't know which of those 100 or $300 investments in yourself is going to be the one that pays off. But all you need is one of them ever to give you a five or $10,000 raise. And it's worth a couple hundred thousand dollars over your lifetime and will pay for itself literally a hundred times over. Mm. You know, I think that's where a lot of people get stopped up is not knowing exactly, you know, is this going to pay off? And again, like the higher we make the stakes for ourselves, the more terrifying it becomes. I think justifiably so, because at some point you ramp it up, it's a lot of money. So start smaller scale. You don't have to be that intensive out of the gate. Writing classes, Toastmasters for public speaking, Word or Excel, whatever it is, you know, whatever office application it is that's relevant in your in your job and career, even that kind of stuff mm-hmm. can be a path forward for making more dollars and moving up and lifting that human capital up. There's a lot of chatter about, you know, the idea of freeing yourself from domestic tasks so that you can focus on career development, on educating your, uh, on building an education for yourself, on building a side hustle. How do you evaluate that? I look at it in a similar way. And I'm one of those people that over the years has, has basically become obsessed with finding any way to let go of small tasks and things that just free my mind a little. So I, I you know, wrote a article on the blog a couple months ago. It was basically why I'll spend $100 on a tech tool that saves me a minute a day. Mm-hmm. Truly. And why would you? Here's basically how it boils down to me is saving a minute a day is five minutes a week, is 20 minutes a month, is about four hours a year. Mm-hmm. So at four mm-hmm. hours a year, and that, that's a half a day of cumulative productivity. So as long as I've got work that pays me more than about $25 an hour, I am technically making money every time I spend 100 bucks on something that saves me a minute a day. Hmm. While that's hard to quantify off of like the first one minute thing, right. the cumulative impact is where it really starts to add up. So you in practice, I probably spend one or two thousand dollars a year on a wide range of little one off technology tools, uh, you know, Dropbox Pro and Evernote and some social media tools because I do a lot of that for my business. And you just one thing after another, most of which are are individually fairly small scale. But when you start adding them all up and, and it's like, wow, I'm saving 10 or 20 or 30 minutes a day of all these little things that each of which took a trivial minute or two, but added up like half an hour a day is a lot of time. That's a couple hours a week. That's a day or two a month. That's a week or two a year. And also like that's you know the difference between whether I can find the time to take a extended vacation with my family or not comes down to, did I spend a little bit of money on little miscellaneous tools that saved me a minute or two here and there? Because it, it really does add up over time. And, you know, likewise, uh, in part, because we also are a family with three small children, you know, me and Amazon Prime, we're tight. <laughs> Amazon visits our house probably at least five days a week, occasionally six. Usually uh, we managed to have one day where we accidentally failed to order something that also <laughs> arrives from Amazon. We'll get back to this interview with Michael in just a moment. First, I want to ask you a question. How much time and or money do you spend just dealing with food, whether it's going to the grocery store or ordering takeout or picking up 
I mean, you've got to make lists and organize everything and figure out what you have and figure out what you're going to have. It's all kind of a big time and money suck. Enter Blue Apron. They're a sponsor of our show, and they are a company that delivers fresh, high-quality ingredients to your doorstep that allow you to cook a really nice, healthy, homemade meal by yourself or with your family. They send you everything you need, including the recipe cards and exact portioned out ingredients so that you can kind of get rid of the small stuff and just focus on creating a really good meal. I started using them recently, and one of the unexpected benefits is that I've actually become a better cook as a result of using them. They've sort of turned into this de facto cooking class. That wasn't something that I expected. So if you want to give them a try for free, they've got some great meals coming up in February, including a cashew chicken stir fry. This one's exciting to me. It's an udon noodle soup with miso and soft boiled eggs, which is like hashtag not something I ever thought I'd learn how to cook. But I guess I'm going to be learning that in February. So anyway, if you want to give them a try for free, you can get your first three meals free, including free shipping, by going to blueapron.com slash afford. Again, that's blueapron.com slash afford, A-F-F-O-R-D. Check them out. Let me know what you think. Hey there, this is Paula, and I want to take a moment to give a shout out to one of my favorite sponsors, Audible. They're a service that provides audiobooks and other types of audio entertainment. And so if you are an Audible subscriber, as I am, you can every month download one or two or however many new audiobooks you want to download. Then you can listen to these when you're in the car, when you're at the gym, when you're at the grocery store, just whenever you're running errands. You can always have a book in your ear. I tend to listen to audiobooks when I'm at the gym. In fact, if I'm really into a book, I spend more time at the gym just because I like I, just one more chapter. So um, being an Audible subscriber has been a ton of fun. I've been able to super up my book content, and I highly recommend it. If you want to give them a try for free for 30 days, head to audible.com slash try now. That's audible.com slash try now. That will give you a free 30-day trial, so you can check them out, see if you like them. And if you do, and I, I hope you do, stick around and use them as a service that will help you listen to more books. Amazon visits our house probably at least five days a week, occasionally six. Usually uh, we manage to have one day where we accidentally fail to order something that also <laughs> arrives from Amazon. And it just comes down to, you know, life is crazy and there's so much stuff going on between work and family and kids and all the rest that if I can save a little bit of time by, you know, getting something delivered and not needing to go out to the store to pick something up and that saves me a couple of minutes that I can spend with my kids, like, that's an easy no-brainer trade-off to me. Mm -hmm. And again, I find that when you don't focus on your human capital and your earning potential first, everything about the money coming into your household feels scarce. It feels, you know, it's, it's a limited pie. We can only carve up the pie. And so all of a sudden it's like, well, why, why would you spend a couple of dollars doing that when uh, you, know, you could just do it yourself and save the money because we could say we could literally save the money or do something else with it. And again, the way that I look at it is what can I do to generate more return on my time to generate more value on my human capital? Because the numbers are actually so much bigger on the human capital. You know, the, like the first time I, well, you know, for our world, it pretty much was getting my CFP certification. You know, I went and got my CFP certification. That's certified financial planner certified financial planner, mm -hmm. and use that to get me a new job that got me a, a $10,000 promotion when I switched firms to a job I could have only gotten with my CFP. And at the point I got my $10,000 raise with my CFP, uh, I still remember my basic personal commitment to myself was, you know, all that discussion we have about whether the like uh, the Starbucks habit is worth it. Mm -hmm. I said, screw it. I'm never going to care about that again. Mm. Yeah. Because once you do a $10,000 raise, for the next 30 years, all this stuff, and granted, I don't even have that hardcore of a Starbucks habit, but like a daily Starbucks habit still 
does not add up to that much when you move the needle that much on your human capital. It might feel like a big number and it often is a big number if you just look at it from the perspective of the money that comes in. Mm -hmm. But if you focus that you can also move the needle on how much is coming in in the first place, it takes the focus off a lot of the spending minutia and puts it frankly where I think it belongs, which is what you're earning and what you're doing to earn more in the first place. And so you know, even in terms of how we live our lifestyle, you know, there's there's basically three things I, I actually sweat, I care about. Mm-hmm. How much I'm earning, what we're doing to, originally to build my salary. Now it's really to build my businesses because I kind of did the morph from employee to entrepreneur over the time. But, you know, what's happening with with our income and what can we do to reinvest in ourselves to earn more? What are we spending on the house? Because a house is a really big line item. Spending, and do you mean mortgage or do you mean like decorating? What do you mean by spending on the house? Mortgage slash rent, you know, whatever you're okay. kind of put okay. the roof over my head. So part what's of the your, fixed costs uh, you of mean? Of your budget. Yep. Yeah. And what do we spend on a car? Because mm-hmm. they're giant line items. Right. And once you do a pretty good job on the income, the car and the house, and basically you make the car and the house reasonable to the income, a lot of the rest of it starts to melt away. You know, I don't sweat spending $50 here or $100 there because for the first 10 years of my career, my total combined rent plus car payments was hovered between 6 and 8% of my income mm-hmm. because I bought a cheap old beat up car mm-hmm. and <laughs> drove it to its grave mm-hmm. and never had, a, never had a car payment. And even at the point I was making some pretty good money. I split an apartment with two of my buddies through the entire decade of my 20s so that I could just save and bank the money, which eventually became the cushion I used when I switched to make my side hustle my full-time business and then ultimately became the down payment on the house where I'm raising my family. And so when you start with the big items, income and human capital, number one, and then the big two expenditures, house or shelter and car – If you do well on those, what you'll find is the stress around a lot of the other stuff really starts to melt away. Now, with the emphasis on human capital and earning and and boosting your earnings potential in whichever way you choose to do so, whether it's through advancing in your primary career, building a side hustle or whatever, the the one point where I keep getting hung up is that it then, to me, it becomes hard to justify not working because if you value your time at X per hour, then every hour that you're taking a shower is costing you, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's an expensive shower. Yeah, it, I, I'll admit, I mean, it, it does when you do when you do this well, uh, mm-hmm. it does become a challenge from the other end. If you actually get really, really good at monetizing your time and you get your time up to a pretty valuable point, it becomes very difficult to actually figure out when and how to say yes or say no to things or or when to cut it off. And the irony is the more the income potential t- climbs, the more your time per hour climbs, uh, however you, you sort of do- carve up the value of your time, uh, the harder it gets to say no to things because just the, the yeah. dollars get bigger. I mean, at some point it's like, well, I didn't really want to do this, but hey, I could spend a couple hours on it over the weekend and it's a material amount of money for my household, so I kind of want to do that. Right. And it can become a slippery slope for people. Right, right. You're struggling to figure out when you ultimately say no. Uh, you know, I, I talk about it and with some of the folks that I work with is as saying, what's the, what's the filter you use to decide whether you're going to keep doing work or take that next client or do that next thing? Uh, in the early stages, the filter usually is, is money. Like, is this a bigger client, a better opportunity, a gig that can pay me more, you know, whatever that side hustle thing looks like. And you know, as long as this is a, a bigger opportunity than some of the other ones, then I'm going to say it's worthwhile. And you can keep inching up the threshold. You know, I, I, uh, I'm not going to take any gigs that pay me at least, unless I make at least 20 bucks an hour, 30 bucks an hour, 50 bucks an hour, $100 an hour, and, and you just keep moving the, the needle up. Eventually, the challenge becomes if, if it goes well, there are lots of opportunities coming in. They're all coming in at that number. And it gets really hard to figure out how you're going to say no. You have to find new filters to figure out what are you going to say yes to and what are you going to say no to? What are some of the filters that you've either you've used or that you know other people have used? So we come at it a couple of different ways. I've ended up developing a few filters for what I use in screen by. Number one is just 
does it move the business forward in the grand scheme of things? There's mm-hmm. there's a fascinating book I highly recommend called uh, Essentialism by mm. Greg McCune. Yeah. And a fantastic book. The idea of it is for people that are successful and even for whole businesses that are successful, often the thing that makes them successful is they find a thing they do that they do very well. They do it a whole bunch. They build a reputation for doing it really well. And it turns into a successful career or income or business. The more successful that you become, the more people start to notice and the more people that start to notice it, the more opportunities come to you. The challenge as the opportunities come in is if you're not careful about what you say yes to and what you say no to, eventually all this stuff is coming in and you actually lose the focus that made you successful in the first place. Mm-hmm. And so uh, you know, Greg has a number of fantastic sayings in the book, but one that that for a long time has resonated with me is that the difference between successful people and very successful people is that very successful people are better at saying no. Mm. And it's a it's a really kind of interesting and counterintuitive phenomenon, but it really is a dynamic that happens when if if you're successful, if you can get that snowball starting to roll down the hill, you know, the challenge is snowballs turn and turn into giant avalanches is that what starts out really focused eventually just gobbles up anything in its path and and becomes unmanageable and you lose the focus that made you successful in the first place. So for me, one of the big filters is just, it does this still ultimately stick towards the the core of what I'm doing. And, and the core of what I'm doing is, you know, my focus is primarily working with financial advisors and trying to help them be more successful in their businesses and help more of their clients with better solutions. And so I do very, very little that does not directly fit that. And anything that's going to go outside of that, I mean, I literally give myself an allowance of, you know, I will do one or two unrelated things every month of, you know, maybe it's an outside engagement or an outside podcast or something of that nature. And beyond that, I'm I'm just going to say no, because it's not part of the core focus. Mm -hmm. The second filter for me, frankly, once I got married and had kids was, you know, I'm I'm just going to push that weekends are more sacred time for me. Uh, Mm -hmm. When I was single and on my own, then even the early years when my wife and I were were married, but there were no kids yet, and our our lives and worlds were much more flexible. Like, you know, hey, if if there's a gig opportunity that's on the weekend, like, eh, whatever, Uh, I'll I'll travel, maybe it's to a cool city, it's fine. Now that we've got kids, you know, for me, one of the filters just, hey, this is a cool engagement and a great opportunity, I'd love to work with you, but I'm, I'm sorry, I just, I don't, I don't travel for engagements on Saturday, it's family time for me. You know, they become kind of arbitrary lines because the reality is at some point, if that success flywheel starts rolling, you have to f- come up some ways to introduce constraints, even if they're arbitrary or or the business can start to consume you or your career can start to consume you. And and I'm sure, you know, almost everyone can think of people they know where their businesses or jobs started to consume them. One other direction I'd maybe encourage people to think about as well as as you look at some of these dynamics of how do we move down the path towards financial independence, kind of recognizing this balance between human capital and our earning ability and then what we spend and what we save. Mm -hmm. But the other area that I, I probably see people get in trouble with the most is the phenomenon called lifestyle creep. Ah, yes. So this effect that if you're successful and you you do reinvest in yourself, you get that job, you get that raise, you get that something that moves you forward. And you say like, wow, I'm, I'm feeling less stressed about my money. Things are going a little better. I saved a little more last year. You know, I'm going to reward numero uno here a little, and, and I'm going to do something nice for myself. And not that it's bad to do something nice for yourself. It's actually very healthy to do something nice for yourself. But the trouble that people get into is that They don't just do something for themselves that's a nice one-time thing. They do something for themselves that permanently changes their lifestyle in a way that makes it harder to move forward in the future. Just the reality of how we seem to be hardwired. We have a couple of sort of problematic forces that hit us at the same time. Number one is that we're very, very quick to adjust and adapt to our current circumstances. So, you know, the new house seems amazing. And then after a year or two, it's just another house that I got to repair and deal with it. The new car seems amazing. I love the new car smell. But then the next X years, I'm going to own it. 
it's just the car I drive around and loses its newness and specialness. And, and you know, we do this across the board from the cars we buy to the computers and technology toys we buy and almost everything in between. And the problem that crops up for people is they make what amount to permanent lifestyle decisions. And in the near term, it's, you know, they feel happy and elated and it's kind of neat to have a new thing. But relatively quickly, the joy of the new thing wears off, and the only thing that's left is the cost of it that you have to bear for a long time. Because the second cruel thing that goes with this is while we adapt very quickly to the upside, you know, things get better, but then we lift up our standard of living, and then it's just our standard of living. It's not a new thing anymore. Uh, most of us horrifically hate going backwards. Uh, mm -hmm. We hate feeling like we're going backwards. We hate losing and giving anything up. You know, I, I may have gotten relatively bored with it, but if you take it away, then I'm going to be pissed. So <laughs> you know, we, we get ourselves into into trouble. And, and I see this all over the place. It's, you know, I got a raise and then I go and get a fancy new apartment. And it's really cool to have the new apartment. It's really fun to socialize in. But now you're actually not any closer to financial independence than you were before because you lifted your expenses up by as much or more than you lifted your savings up. And now you're not actually making any progress. And I watch so many people dig a hole for themselves. One of the biggest problems we actually see, uh, our, our firm does actually a lot of work with people who are retiring or in kind of the final five to 10 year stretch before retirement. And one of the biggest pinch that we commonly see for most of them is they have all sorts of regrets about the lifestyle, the, the things that crept up into their lifestyle through, I find particularly their 30s and 40s, because that tends to be when some of our biggest income raises and career advancements come. And so those are sort of the, the big opportunity moments where we can make these decisions because we, we get stuck in these traps. You know, the, the car feels cool when I buy it, but the new feeling wears off. But the car payments keep going for five years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the big new mortgage the big new house feels really cool for the first year or two, but the big mortgage is going to be with you for 30. And people get themselves into trouble with allowing their lifestyle to creep upwards. And, and sometimes we don't even realize we're doing it. It's, you know, it's the time that you finally decide you're going to stop mowing the lawn. You're going to have someone else mow the lawn for you. And the first time you pay someone else to mow your lawn, for most people, is like the last time they ever want to mow their own lawn. And then you get stuck. So like, it's not just, hey, I'm going to have someone come out and mow my lawn for a couple bucks. It's, no, no, you're going to have someone come out and mow your lawn for the next 30 years because once you do it, you almost never go backwards. So that is really where the crux of my question lies, because with a, a McMansion or a fancy car, it's easy to see that that has no value on your earning potential. Yep. But with something like, say, mowing the lawn, cleaning your house, you know, ways in which you trade money for time – those do have an impact, uh, or at least arguably do have an impact on your ability to to earn. And they do. you know, kind of goes back to that human capital investing in yourself piece of it. You know, Amazon Prime, uh, another good example. And that to me is basically the distinction. Like, are you buying time for pleasure, or are you buying time for for business and earnings? And and I think there's a difference between the two. And not to say that buying time for your business is good and buying time for yourself is bad because frankly a lot of the research now that's coming forth on how to spend money in ways that makes you happy one of the biggest ways you can actually spend money that makes you happy is uh spending it in ways that give you time it's actually a uh, spending money on time is much better correlated to happiness than spending money on objects and things but I, I think the crux of that question really comes back to what is the purpose of how you're how you're spending the money on time. Is it for pleasure or is it for business and work and earnings potential? But, and, but I mean, you yourself said the reason – we'll use Amazon Prime as an example. You know, the reason that you pay for a, an Amazon Prime account and then also not even bother shopping around, just, you know, buy yep. the item on Amazon without looking at – without price comparing, you know, toothpaste across five different stores – is because you would rather spend that time with your kids, which is pleasure and not business. Yep. But I look at those decisions very deliberately. And in our household, like we spend time actually thinking about when we're going to introduce some some new expense, whether it's as directly related to time savings as that or not. Mm -hmm. When we're going to do any, any kind of regular expense that's going to be ongoing, it is actually a conversation, a conscious thought. Like, what am I doing this for? Why am I doing it? And you know, do I want to saddle myself with this forever? Because 
Lord knows after a couple of years of Amazon Prime delivery, like I have no tolerance to go to a store anymore. <laughs> it's kind of bad. It's a little unhealthy. Oh, it's great. I love it. I'm, yeah, I personally am very, very happy with it. Have, have, no about have you decision. found Google Express, by the way? It's my new obsession. No, we haven't looked at Google Express, but I am based in the D.C. area. So we are we are now getting uh, two hour delivery ramp ups on Amazon Prime. And, and there's there's really nothing quite so special as just deciding one morning you want a thing. And, you know, Amazon drops off to your house that afternoon. I figure within a couple of years, we'll just hit a button on a phone and like a little drone will drop it on a helipad out, by, out behind the house. So <laughs> uh, I, I love it. I love the <laughs> I love the progress on it. Uh, but. Again, like we look at those things very deliberately about, okay, this is a thing we're going to introduce into our lives that once we do it, we're going to have trouble going back. So just make sure you actually want to pull the the trigger on that. And I found for us, I mean, it was a progression over time. You know, frankly, if I do the math on my income, the income per dollar hour is good enough that I can justify almost any of those trade offs at this point. Uh, I couldn't do that years ago, but I can now that my my income has grown. But the progression along the way that we were giving conscious thought to throughout was, is this a dollars for time thing or is this a dollars for object? And if it's dollars for time thing, am I doing it for myself or am I doing it for trading off business and work and earnings opportunity? And and honestly, like early on, most of them were trading off for business opportunity time. You know, it was hey, it would be nice if I didn't need to mow the lawn so that I could actually spend time doing a little bit more client stuff because that's what brings the money in and puts food on the table and and uh, uh, shoes for my children. Over time, that started to morph a little to the point where he said, okay, we've got kind of the, the work stuff figured out now. That's going well. Now it becomes a question of trading time for sort of personal stuff or family time and, or the rest. But our, our starting point with that, just recognizing those dynamics was, you know, be very careful about introducing expenses into your life that are recurring. That to me is probably the single biggest kind of warning slash takeaway for people to bear in mind. Like spending money on time because you take a vacation, that's great. You can have a wonderful time, even lots of research that validates it's a wonderful way to, to literally enjoy your money and, and find some happiness. But you you take a vacation and then next year you'll see how things are going and decide whether or what kind of vacation you're going to want to take. That's very different from I got a raise. I'm not taking a vacation. I got a raise. I'm going to go buy myself a new car where no matter what happens with your job and your income and the rest next year and the year after and the year after that, you're going to have the car payment. Mm. It's going to be sticking around. So number one, I think, is just giving thought to any when you introduce new expenses into your life. Be cognizant of that lifestyle creep effect that when you add them in, it's really hard to subtract them later. So so be cognizant about what you're spending on. And then likewise, be be cognizant of just why are you doing it? I mean, is it is it because you just want a thing? Is it because you are trying to save time for work? Is it because you're trying to save time for family or personal life? And I mean, any of those can be fine, at least in moderation. But just taking the pause even to ask the question about why you're doing it often helps to to avoid some problems because a, a lot of the time we just see these things out of impulse and we don't even realize the the trap we put ourselves in until after the fact when we think about having to give up something that we don't want to give up. Okay. So um, unfortunately, I have to go fairly soon. But final question uh, before we wrap up is, let's say that you're making, you're faced with those decisions, right? You're So you're thinking about... You've got $5,000 and you could either spend this money on a combination of buying more time for yourself via outsourcing some of your domestic household chores and errands slash, you know, taking classes like you can spend it on yourself that way or you can put it into a total stock market index fund. How do you make that comparison? I mean, particularly not given the, the ambiguity of the outcome. I guess that's what this whole conversation has been about, but yeah, I mean, I mean, some of it is. Mm-hmm. So I, I think there's a few ways that I, I look at that question. Number one is just like, what's your time horizon? You know, the reality is, if you're within five or even sometimes ten years of of retirement, uh, unless you're on one amazing career trajectory, like you can only move the needle so much on your career and your earnings power over just a couple of years. Mm-hmm. So if your time horizon is only a couple of years until your retirement. 
I'd probably just stuff it into the retirement account and, you know, buy my total market index and hope the market cooperates for a few more years. Mm -hmm. The longer your time horizon, the more the the contributions towards human capital matter, because just literally like it's such a bigger number, right? When I when I've still got a couple of decades left to work, you know, my total investment accounts are 20 grand and my total human capital is worth one point five million dollars. So like which one would you invest into the you know, you get. You make 10% on your 20 grand, you make $2,000. You make 10% on your one and a half million, you make 150 grand. Like one of these has much better compounding potential. It's it's just literally the better investment opportunity. Mm -hmm. Now, where you go with it from there, I think depends a lot on the nature of the work and the income earning opportunity you have. Things like, hey, I want to hire someone to do some domestic tasks so I can free up a little bit more time. You know, my question for that immediately goes back to, if you're going to buy some time, I think you got to have a pretty clear sense of where it's going. So mm-hmm. if you're if you're doing freelance work as a side gig and you're making X dollars an hour, like fantastic. Uh, if you got a side gig and you're making thirty dollars an hour, technically anything you can let go of that costs you twenty five dollars an hour or less, so that you can spend time doing the thirty dollar an hour stuff, you are making money. You are minting money for yourself every time you pay to delegate. And the higher your income lifts up, the more it pays to delegate. If you can make $50 an hour, you should let go of anything that's $45 an hour or less, and, and you can keep moving the needle up. That works well if you've got some kind of freelance gig or business you own or hourly project, like something where you can actually trade your time for money that directly. Mm-hmm. Not everyone's in that position. If you're not, then frankly, I'm a little bit wary about telling people to trade time for money or money for time unless they just want to literally do it for their lifestyle because I can pretty much guarantee you if you do that trade, you're not going to want to go backwards. And if you do that trade without a sense of where you're going with it, you may just end up having a more expensive lifestyle and finding yourself in a deeper hole than you may be in now. What if you are making that trade for a business that is not profitable yet, but you're hoping will be profitable in the future? Or if you are making that trade so that you could go back to school to pursue a graduate degree? You know, if you're making the trade because you're trying to get to one of those breakthroughs, Mm -hmm. I think it's a reasonable trade, again, with the caveat that, and and I I say this ironically as someone that's got two master's degrees, (laughs) uh, one of the last things I put on that list is going back to school for graduate degrees. Not that you don't get there at some point. Obviously, I I literally did, and I can definitely say it was very rewarding for my long-term career. But it wasn't the first thing I went back for. You know, I graduated as an undergrad and I went and got a job. And then I got a designation in my profession and I got another one and I got another one. Even when I ultimately went back to grad school, I went to grad school at night, part time while I was working full time. So I did have to do a little bit of time for money kind of trades so that I could do grad school classes two nights a week for a long period of time. But, you know, I I didn't walk away from full time job to go into full time grad school and do that, that kind of big time for money shift. Cause frankly, to me, that, that was a risky trade-off. You know, I was reasonably confident investing in myself into the grad school program I was taking was going to be worthwhile, but that doesn't mean I want to go all in on it and risk coming out at the other end and not finding the income potential that I was expecting. Mm -hmm. So I, I deliberately hedged my bets by keeping the job, keeping the day job, Mm -hmm. doing the grad school at night. It took more than twice as long to get through it but I had a steadier, less risky path going through it. And then ultimately at the end was was able to find some new opportunities that move the career forward. You know, I'd start again with the smaller scale stuff, which is, can I join Toastmasters? Can I take a writing skills class? Can I, you know, beef up my Excel and PowerPoint and Microsoft Word skills or whatever it is that you use at your company or your business or your industry? You know, I'd, I'd, I'd start with the smaller scale stuff. I, I think we tend to you know, I see a lot of people that go out and they try to buy buy a degree as a path to higher income. Mm. And it's not the degree that gets you the path to higher income. It's the skills. It's the training and experience. And frankly, it's the confidence that you end out getting when you know you're good at what you do, because you tend to sell yourself better and get negotiate better jobs and raises and gigs and all that stuff, whatever, whatever uh, your business is when you've got that confidence. So if you if you approach it, you know, don't approach it as I want to buy a degree to get a better job. Approach it as I want to buy some training to improve my skills to move down a better path. Mm. And and just what you'll find is skills training is often actually much more reasonably priced 
than trying to buy degrees. And so I, I find it, it tends to be a more stable path and actually a less expensive one. Right, right. Absolutely. Taking classes, taking specific classes on specific topics that you want to learn about is much cheaper. Yeah. <laughs> cheaper and less time and arguably more effective. Yeah. And the other thing just to note to it, you know, a, a lot of these changes, I mean, you may also just have to go through a period of time where you got to buck up and put in a little more time for getting it done. You know, I, I've still seen people that are trying to make this transition or like, well, I'm, I'm really aggravated because, you know, I'm trying to take this uh, training class to improve my job, but my boss won't give me Friday afternoons off to study. So I'd say like, you're trying to get a better career for the next 20 or 30 years. Spend a couple Sundays. Mm-hmm. Put in the time yourself. I mean, if you do it forever, eventually you're going to get grumpy about it because you're going to want your time back. But, you know, recognize that for some of these as well, like, it's okay to, to put in an extra sprint for a stage as well. Sometimes the big reinvestment you make isn't buying time. It's just committing some time to try to get a breakthrough and move forward. Right. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Michael. My pleasure. I hope it's food for thought for people. We, we kind of ranged across a wide spectrum of, of uh, financial and career topics. Yeah, I think this was excellent. Where can people find you if they'd like to know more about you? Uh, so you can find me in two places, kitsis.com, which is my own site and blog and kind of personal platform these days of the, uh, the various businesses I'm involved with. And then I'm also a co-founder of a group called the XY Planning Network, which is actually a network of financial advisors specifically that work with folks in their 20s, 30s, and 40s on these kinds of issues. So you know, most financial advisors out there sell products or they manage assets kind of our champion mission and find and at XY Planning Network is we just do financial planning for a monthly subscription fee. No products, no asset minimums, none of that stuff. Just if you want some advice and coaching, you know, we have a network of a couple hundred advisors around the country that do that. So uh kids.com is the personal site and XY Planning Network.com is our advisor network and that pretty much consumes my world these days. Nice. And I will link to both of those in the show notes. All right, awesome. Well thank you very much. Thank you, Michael, for coming on to the show. Now, what are some of the key takeaways that we got from this? Here are three that stood out to me. Number one, lifestyle inflation isn't necessarily bad per se, but it's better if you are to inflate your lifestyle, it's better to use your money in a way that buys back your time. So ask yourself, are you trading a dollar for time or are you trading a dollar for an object? A couple of examples. If you decide to lifestyle inflate by... uh, Paying for salon haircuts instead of just cutting your own hair or getting like the cheap $12 supercut cut, cut, that's something that's not going to give you any more time. In fact, it'll actually probably take away time because, you know, what you were doing before was probably faster. If you decide to inflate your lifestyle in terms of getting blowouts and pedicures and uh, or buying a fancy car or a McMansion. Yeah, all of those are lifestyle inflation examples in which you're not buying any time for yourself. You're just spending money. But lifestyle inflation in which you decide to start outsourcing certain tasks, mowing your lawn, cleaning your house, ordering things from Amazon Prime or Google Express, Those are ways in which you can inflate your lifestyle. Yeah, it's going to cost you more money, but it will bring you back time. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that you should do it. It's just that these are different classes of lifestyle inflation and ought to be uh, weighed differently. Basically, there's a certain point at which we should acknowledge that not all lifestyle inflation is created equal and that trading a dollar for an hour is very different. Not not literally a dollar, but you know what I mean. Trading dollars for hours is very different than trading dollars for objects. So that's one of the takeaways that I got from this conversation. By the way, quick pause here because I want to kind of relate a few personal anecdotes. (laughs) First of all, Google Express, I'm not being paid to say this. I just found this. uh, So I've I've been an avid Amazon Prime user for a while. I actually had to put myself on an Amazon Prime fast because I was overdoing it. But uh, I'm back to Amazon Prime now, and it's amazing because all of this stuff, stuff that I would get in my car and drive to the store to buy now just comes to me. So, for example, I subscribe to protein powder on Amazon. So instead of having to drive to the store and buy protein powder, it comes to me as a monthly subscription so I don't even have to think about it, which is extremely helpful given the fact that Will's been a vegetarian for 31 years now, and he's 
you know, relatively protein deprived were it not for the powder. He doesn't eat meat or fish or even eggs. So um, yeah, that that thing's been great to have. Anyway, Google Express, it's the same business model as Amazon Prime. You pay a flat rate. I think it's around $99 a year. And they'll send you stuff from a variety of stores, including, and this is the kicker, including Costco. So for a hundred bucks a year, I never have to physically go to Costco again. Like I'm obviously going to be saving way more than four hours a year just by virtue of not having to get into my car, drive to Costco and run around that whole store trying to find pine nuts and bags of whole bean coffee. So yeah, there's my little rant. Totally not being paid to say that, but uh, yeah, it's it's my new it's my new favorite find. But anyway, the actual story that I wanted to relate before I became an unpaid Google spokesperson was uh, that I personally, I have struggled a lot with this question of how to value your time, particularly in the context of when you are using your dollars to buy back your time. How do you generate a value for that? Because if you were to simply state, uh, for example, you might state I make $50,000 per year. And so if you work 40 hours a week times 50 weeks a year, that's 2,000 working hours per year. So if you made $50,000 a year, then you would be making $25 an hour. But that type of math or that type of reasoning is a little bit flawed. Number one, because not all hours are created evenly. There are some hours in which you're focused and some in which you're not. There are some, if you're self-employed, there are billable hours versus non-billable hours. Um, And so I've never really known how to value an hour, especially being self-employed. You know, there are certain hours in which I'm, for that hour, literally making thousands of dollars. And there are many, many, many other hours in which I'm working, making zero. And, you know, a variety of hours in between, depending on if I'm writing an article, if I'm giving a speech, if I'm futzing around with my Twitter account, if I'm checking email, if I'm generally like kind of half-heartedly checking email, but sort of also staring into space. I mean, part of the difficulty in calculating the value of an hour comes from that. The other part of the difficulty, though, comes from the fact that there are 168 hours a week. And so if you were to say my hour is worth $25 or $50 or $100, whatever it is, doesn't matter. If you were to say that my hour is worth X, then any hour that you're not working is, you know, by logical extension, an hour in which you are paying the opportunity cost of not earning X. And so like I mentioned during the interview, that leads to some really weird logical, like, extremes, right? Because, all right, if an hour is worth 40 bucks, then does that mean that the hour that I just spent watching Westworld cost me $40? Or logically, does that mean that if it takes me seven hours to read a book, then the cost of reading that book was $280? Like you see where this is going, right? Like if you you need to put some boundaries around your hours. And so it logically doesn't quite make sense to just... Uh, you know, issue a blanket statement that if an hour of your time is worth $40, then that applies evenly to all hours of your life. And it also logically doesn't make sense to um, to state that if you m- hired somebody to mow your lawn and that saved you an hour and then you increased your workload by one hour, that you have therefore arbitraged mowing your lawn. Because even if you are working for one additional hour, Why does that one additional hour come from the lawn mowing rather than, say, uh, one fewer hour that you sleep or one fewer hour that you cook or just one fewer hour that you like kind of putz around generally like staring out the window and not really doing a whole lot? You know, even if you increased your workload by an extra hour a week, that hour could have come from anywhere. So logically, the trading dollars for hours never really made a whole lot of sense to me. And I struggled with this for a very long time. And the best answer that I have found so far came from the author Laura Vanderkam. She was a guest on our show in episode 38. We'll link to that in the show notes. But Laura's advice was, first, fill your schedule with all of the things that you cannot outsource, such as reading books, exercising, calling your mom, sleeping, showering. Those are all the things that you just you can't outsource. So fill your schedule with that first. 
And then once you've completely filled your schedule with that, if you have any time remaining, then you can start putting in the things that are outsourceable. I loved that explanation because it removed this kind of false rationalization of equating time with money, which I think is not like mathematically and logically, it just doesn't work to to try to make a linear one to one exchange between time and money. And so by first filling your schedule with the things that you cannot outsource, and then if and only if there's time remaining, adding in the things you can, that just seems like a much better framework. And it's one that doesn't drive me to like, it just doesn't drive me insane by taking me to the edge of logical extremes, which is where I was going when people were trying to give the argument of an hour of your time is worth X. So I went off on a bit of a tangent there, but that is all to say that there are three major takeaways that I got from this conversation with Michael Kitsis. The first of those three major takeaways is to think about uh, whether you're trading a dollar for an hour versus whether you're trading a dollar for an object. And if you are going to inflate your lifestyle, ideally do it in such a way in which you're trading dollars for hours more so than objects. So that is chief takeaway number one. Takeaway number two that I got out of this interview was uh, to be very careful about recurring expenses. So uh, as Michael said, taking a vacation or taking a trip traveling is not a recurring expense. You do it once and, and you don't ever have to do it again. Versus getting a large mortgage. I mean, that's a recurring payment that you're going to have to make for the life of the mortgage. So uh, be careful about about any of those because you're you're locking your future into higher fixed costs. And the higher your fixed costs, the less freedom you have, the less flexibility that you have. So think very carefully before you start uh, literally mortgaging your future. Chief takeaway number three that I got from our conversation This came at the very end when he said, it's not the degree, it's the skills and the confidence. So if you are going to invest in yourself by virtue of learning, don't necessarily fall into the dominant paradigm of thinking that education only comes from an institution that can grant you a diploma. Because certainly there are some careers in which you need a diploma. If you want to be a dentist, you're going to have to go through the requisite schooling. Uh, If you want to be a doctor, ditto. But for a lot of fields, you don't necessarily need a degree to be a writer or to be a business owner. You need skills and you need education and training that can help you get those skills. But that doesn't mean that you have to enroll in, uh, in a master's program for that necessarily. So... Invest in yourself, but look for more cost-effective ways of doing it that, you know, more cost-effective than going into grad school. And particularly if you have to go into a bunch of debt to go into grad school, again, you're putting a big recurring expense onto your future. Be wary of that. So those are the three takeaways that I got from this. All of the websites and books and everything that we mentioned are going to be linked to in the show notes, which you can find at affordanything.com slash episode 64. That's episode 64. So check out the show notes. While you're there, subscribe to uh, getting regular updates of the show notes delivered to your inbox every Monday morning. And if you like this show, please do me a favor, head to iTunes and leave us a review. Thank you so much for listening. My name is Paula Pant. This is the Afford Anything Podcast. I'll catch you next week. Did you enjoy this episode? Then grab our free ebook, Escape, by clicking on the cover here. You'll be taken to a page where you can enter your email for immediate access to everything you need to know about escaping the 9 to 5 grind to live life on your terms. And if you enjoyed this podcast, give us a like and subscribe with one simple click to get new episodes every Monday on your YouTube homepage.